So I started to write about platforms in 2002. My first book, Platform Leadership, talked about Intel, Microsoft, Cisco, Palm, and Entity Docomo. I don't think we had the word Google or Amazon or Facebook anywhere in that book. So obviously, some things have changed a lot in the world of platform. And in particular, the pervasive connectivity, uh, the access to the internet everywhere, the fact that we have 7 billion mobile phones, and the fact that people are being connected constantly through their device, the fact that the skills of developing software uh, exist and are distributed all over the globe. Um, all these factors have an, imp an impact on, on the development of platform and the way they are disrupting a lot of industries today. So a number of industries have already been disrupted by platforms and a lot of people talk about how Uber is disrupting taxis, how Airbnb is disrupting hotels, how Booking.com is changing the way people uh, book their own hotels. So these are very salient examples about a kind of platforms which I call transaction platforms. These are the online marketplaces of today which are disrupting business because they are allowing all sorts of individuals all over the world, as long as they own some sort of asset of value, be it a room in your house for Airbnb, or a, a willingness to host your pet for another kind of platform, or some sort of skill such as I'm a handyman or I'm, uh, I know how to do massage. It allows people who have skills and who own assets to exchange between each other and to identify each other. So that's going to continue in a lot of different industries as long as people have skills or assets that they're willing to transact upon. There is another kind of platforms that I talk about, which are what I call the innovation platforms. And these are more what we think of when we think about operating systems or the Apple iPhone, which is the technological heart of an innovation ecosystem filled with innovators who invent apps. In that sense, a platform is not a marketplace through which people exchange, but it is the technological building block upon which other companies or individuals innovate by building complementary services and products. The companies, um, you, uh, which industries are going to be disrupted by those? Well, everything digital now is, is pervasive. Every industry is affected by digital. So it's really hard to see or to foresee which industry is not going to be affected by these. So if I want to predict whether a particular technology has the potential to become a platform and therefore to disrupt the industry in which it's going to operate, I'm asking myself the following question. How essential is this technology to the functioning of a larger system? When I think about essential, I think about the human body. The human body is full of organs, but some organs are more important than others. For example, the brain and the heart are more important than others. If you have an accident and um, you break an arm or you have to be, uh, one of your limbs has to be severed from your body, it's not great for your quality of life, but you will live. If, however, your brain or your heart has a failure, you will not be able to live. If you look at the architecture of the body, you will notice that the brain and the heart are more tightly connected through all sorts of networks. The blood network, the lymphatic system, the nerve system, through all the other organs of the body. So if you want to look at a technology that has the potential to become a platform, find a technology that is connected to a lot of other products and services. So that's the first point. The second point is, how easy is it for external innovators to innovate on top of that platform? So here I'm looking at, are there standards? Are there connectors? Are there some APIs? some open intellectual property or some processes that invite others to innovate on top of the platforms. If these two things exist, the centrality or the essentiality of the technology and the, the easiness of connection to it, you have a really good candidate for a platform.
So how can we reconcile the idea of an, a platform being very open? Because if it's not open to external innovation, it's not going to be successful. And the fact that in the public eye, we see a lot of these successful platforms as not very open and maybe yielding too much power. I think the confusion comes from the fact that many people have an overly naive view of what open means. And some companies have used as marketing ploy uh, uh, the concept of openness to build an image of being a good citizen for the whole world. In reality, all platforms are open on some things and very closed on others. Let's take the example of Google. Google has a lot of open APIs. As a matter of fact, having an open API is an essential feature of most of Google web services. However, at the same time, Google jealously guards and protects its own algorithm. And we understand perfectly well the reason it would do so, because if it wouldn't, it would make it very easy for competitors to imitate the crown jewel, so to speak. So first of all, let's, let's agree on the fact that there is no such thing as something completely open. Once we understand that, the question becomes, from a strategic perspective, if I'm a company who wants to develop my technology and build a platform and an innovation ecosystem around it, what part of my technology do I have to close and to keep closed versus what part of my technology do I need to open? The answer that I propose based on these 15 years of research with a number of co-authors um, suggests that companies are better off opening what I call the connectors or the interfaces. That is, every technology has a heart and has a layer, which is an external layer, like a skin of an orange, so to speak. The openness is better placed around the external layers, whereas the inside of the technology has got to be protected and closed. So how do I know whether, when I have two ecosystems competing with each other, each of them having a, a platform at their core, how do I know which of these ecosystems is more likely to win? In other words, how do we evaluate the competitive advantage of platforms? Well, it's actually rather simple. On the one hand, they still have to beat the other alternative from a competitive point of view. That is, there's still competition across ecosystems. So you've got to provide better value for the end users. Now, in platforms, you might have different categories of end users different sides to the markets. Uh, for example, if you're Google, you have to provide value for the search users, but you also have to provide value for the advertisers. So as a platform, you often deal with a number of markets. You have to provide more value than your competitors for each and every one of these markets. But that's not enough. That's just the competition part of it. The fundamental difference between platform competition and traditional plain vanilla competition between firm A and firm B is that I like to use the metaphor of sports. Plain vanilla competition is between two firms. It's like a game of tennis being played between two players, player one against player two. And platform competition is like a game of football where you have team one versus team two. The role of the platform leader is to be the captain of the team. So this company has got to establish rules norms, the governance of an ecosystem, which is benevolent vis-a-vis -vis a collective of firm with whom, perhaps in a different logic, they would only be treated as either customers or rivals, or under some condition, suppliers. But treating complementors as complementors, recognizing their autonomy, the fact that they have a choice to which ecosystem they are going to contribute to, and establishing this good uh, benevolent governance is going to be key to win in the larger game of platform competition. So there's been a lot of talk about network effects, uh, which uh, by network effects what we mean is that the value of a particular technology gets bigger for the users as more other users are using this technology. And some uh, have even suggested that in the case of network effects, the guaranteed outcome in terms of market structure will be that there will be one winner, winner take all, or a monopolist. Um, more advanced research has actually um, suggested that this is incorrect, that there is only a small set of circumstances under which we can expect uh, 
as the process of natural selection of competition, one winner to emerge. This will only happen if there is no room for differentiation, as well as the network effect being uh, extremely strong. But um, some people take the example of, of Uber, that, that it is monopolistic in certain cities, and even wonder what should the regulator do about it. But let's make no mistake, Companies such as Uber, as well as others, have been buying market share by heavily subsidizing entry into these markets. So the very question of how sustainable that is in the long term, from a pure market perspective, is, um, is, uh, is open. These companies, companies such as Uber, are financed not through um, supply and demand mechanism, but these are investment uh, fueled by venture capital, who are willing to spread their bets over a very large number of, of, uh, of new ventures betting that one out of the hundred that they invest in is going to be the next Facebook. Um, the role of regulators, however, is not to be dismissed uh, because a, a number of these companies that are entering markets such as taxis or hotels or media are actually competing face to um, face to face with other companies that have been subjected to heavy regulation for decades. And therefore, there is naturally a strong reaction from the incumbents who claim that this is a new form of competition which is not fair and there is a lot of clamoring for a new kind of regulation. The problem with that, however, is we have to understand the ways in which platforms create value in a different way and not simply recognize that because incumbents' interest, existing firms' interests, are threatened, that does not necessarily mean that we have to, at all costs, protect the interest of the companies that are already in place. This is a difficult balancing act that regulators have to, have to operate, where they have to look after the welfare of not just the incumbents, not just the suppliers, not just the new entrants, but also the customers and the citizens. So today, it's almost a fashion or a fad to call yourself a platform enterprise. I've done a recent study that shows that 70% uh, of all unicorns today, by unicorns we mean companies whose valuation exceeds $1 billion, 70% of them call themselves platform companies. A closer scrutiny of their business model reveals that some of them are, some of them are not. But the question remains for companies today, is there salvation, is there a future if you are not a platform? Clearly, not every company can become a platform. But there are other ways to succeed within platform competition. If you have a niche and a unique product or service, and you can have a, a way to be a complementor to an existing platform, that could be one way to succeed. Perhaps a better way to succeed is to hedge your bets and not to put all your eggs in one basket, so to speak. That is, try to become a complementor to more than one platform and take advantage of the existing competition against existing platforms to have um, to, 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 to spread your risk, so to speak, and to collaborate into uh, more than one platform. A third way to, to survive and to thrive is that if you really believe that not just your business interest, but the business interest of a lot of other companies are being endangered by the new way of competing from existing platforms, might be to rally with your own competitors and create an alternative platforms together. <laughs>